Hello and welcome to Photography Out Loud. My name is Paul Davis and as always I'm joined with my colleague Joel Longbone. How are you doing? You alright? Yeah, I'm good. I feel better now that I've had a haircut and a, a trim. I feel yeah, you're lighter. Looking, looking pretty sharp there, <laughs> mate, I have to say. Thank you. As are you. Well, yeah, I have had my haircut, but I don't just, feel you like just don't have it different. as short on the sides as I do. So. Yeah, maybe. But then that's what sure. happens when you walk into a barber and he just goes, oh, what you have? And I was just like, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> just so it's not touching my ears anymore is a good start. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. My definitely. hair was starting so... to curl into my ears. And I was like, nah, can't be having that. So, yeah. so I've nice. got to make a big apology straight away because um, I don't know if anyone's like inspecting the, the quality of uh, my stream, but I forgot my camera. Uh, which also means that my prop my audio is probably suffering a little bit as well. So um, honestly, yeah, you have a week off and it all goes to pot. I know, yeah, yeah. And you know, we work in a camera shop. I, I rock up late, <laughs> and then I've got no time. Batteries to... aren't charged. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it is. It is. T- but I'm here. I'm here. I, that, I'm like in the, the really thing. bright spot on this side of your face. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mate, I haven't seen you for a week, so I've got to catch up on some of the sarcasm. So. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, if we're going to talk about anything, we can talk about how it looks like I'm going on holiday with the bags under my eyes because my oh, daughter well. is teething. And Sorry about that. My phone just fell. And uh, <laughs> my wife, uh, my wife, my baby daughter is teething. So sleep, sleep is uh, elusive at the moment. So. No, it's brilliant. So um, no, it's not brilliant. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> I've just realised that you know when I need to move on, I Say always brilliant. go. That's, that's your like. That's brilliant. And then I just realised that that's the thing that I always say. So <laughs> like my <laughs> pet hedgehog just died. My yeah. pet oh, that's brilliant. Died. That. Brilliant. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> just lost a million quid down the drain. Brilliant. <laughs> Ah, oh, this is just going to be an ongoing thing now, isn't it? Where I just drop the it ball is. every week. So mm, <laughs> fantastic! Right, that's there. We go, so David. On. David, yeah, David can add that to his hashtag. Brilliant. He's got a few <laughs> hashtags for us. <laughs> yeah. So sp- oh, speaking about David, uh, it's, it's, uh, very shortly we'll be introducing him onto the stream. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful to have him here. So um, we had him uh, back in. I think it's the first show that we did. Was. We've done many, he's an OG uh, on virtual, yeah, 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 <clears throat> and uh, sort of always a good fact checker for us as well. So, uh, <laughs> one of our regular watchers that keeps us in check, hashtag yeah. you're wrong, <laughs> yeah. So, that, that's always uh, that's always nice. He's, in he's our version of uh, you know, Facebook when somebody puts some like fake news, <laughs> David is our version of uh, Facebook going fake news. <laughs> I yeah, know. you're wrong. <laughs> or what's it on countdown? The guy that sits in the corner with the dictionary. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like Snopes.com for Cambrian. <laughs> well, in recent uh, studies, it was found that Joel and Paul were wrong. There we go. <laughs> so, so uh, before we introduce David onto the stream, have we got any news that we need to share? Yes, we do. Um, so. Not many people perhaps know this. Um, Sigma make fantastic lenses, which most people do know. But they've also uh, created um, the Sigma FP, which is part of the um, L mount, so that they lined up with Panasonic and Leica to create the L mount. So you can buy a a Sigma lens and it'll fit the cameras from those manufacturers that use the L mount. So the FP was created as like a hybrid between uh, video and uh, stills. It's really good. Um, but it, it, it's a it's an interesting design because obviously it's meant to be kind of added on to. It's, it's, um, it's kind of like a modular system, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it, it's it's really small. It's very compact and it's full frame, which is fantastic. Um, I've had a bit of a play with it and I like like using it. Um, and especially with the new lenses because they're so small and they're magnetic caps, which we really, really love. If you don't know what we're talking about, go and watch a video from November where we wax lyrical about Sigma's magnetic caps. I don't care about the optical quality. Um, and they've just brought out a, a 61 megapixel um, version 
um, and a new attachable um, eyepiece because the, uh, the original doesn't have an eyepiece, it's just an LCD screen because you'd normally add a HDMI the, screen to it so you can have a bigger monitor yeah. and stuff, yeah, as part of your rig. So whilst we've not had a play yet, it looks interesting. It'll be interesting to see what landscape photographers make of it and videographers um, with using all of those megapixels. So uh, yeah, it'll be intriguing to see. And also talking about um, Sigma lenses and the small ones, Sony have just announced their small lenses of 24, 2.8, uh, the 40, uh, 2.5 and the 50, 2.5. So, and these are quite compact lenses. So it'll be interesting to see the quality out of those because Sony are making really good quality lenses at the moment as well. So um, hopefully we'll get those to play with soon um, and we'll, we'll let you know how they are. So. I think that's it for the news this week. Um, right. I'm sure David will tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but we should go to the comments. So that's a good segue to the comments. Um, and but, we've got... So I've got to go, that's brilliant. So now can we... No, 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 just say to the comments. <laughs> no, brilliant, just to the comments. Okay, I'll try again. That's brilliant, let's move to the comments. <laughs> You're broken. <laughs> brilliant is like your full stop it's just like your punctuation <laughs> some people use um or uh <laughs> and you just use brilliant <laughs> i wonder what your comma is what, what's your comma word that's what i want to know right so helen smith says hello from cheltenham waving hands and uh, dancing cat ladies um hello <laughs> helen good to see you um and mel says hi guys long time they see hope you're both well we are well I am. Are you okay, Paul? Apart from using brilliant all the time. I'm, I'm brilliant. Thank you. Good. <laughs> so it's good to see you, Mel. And hopefully uh, we'll see you in the shop in the not too distant future. Uh, we've got uh, Johnny Moe saying, afternoon, lads. Likey, likey. 100% <laughs> need to get the t-shirt with that on it. Um, it's been great. Good to see you, Johnny. Um, Helen says, ha, brilliant. <laughs> that, that's your t-shirt, isn't it, Paul? You, you're you're going to have like 10 different sayings on your t-shirt. It's going to be great. Um, Martin Jones says, hi, guys. I hope you're keeping well and safe and keeping busy. Yes, definitely keeping busy. <laughs> I feel like I've not even got half the things done today that I should have got done. But there we go. Such is life at the moment. Um, uh, Tina says, hi, guys. Hello, Tina. And hi to Andrew as well. And hi to Ian. Uh, he says, hi, Paul and Joel. And Richard says, hi, lads. Hi, Richard. Uh, good to see you. And uh, afternoon gents from Andy Boardman. So hello, Andy. Good to see you as well. Um, it's yeah, always nice to see right. comments popping up on our um, things. Makes us feel like we're not just talking to each other through a computer, which we could do without potentially. So, um, Johnny says, Paul, what phrase word does Joel always say? Ooh. That, I know exactly what it is. And Ooh. you don't, do you? You don't know what your, you don't know what it is, do you? <laughs> I probably do when you say it. Okay, you go, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's definitely that. <laughs> I feel like it's one and of those that will always lead in to another question that you're going to ask. Oh yeah, I'm definitely a because question you, you never you person. never leave a conversation with without without another question attached to it either. <laughs> that's true, rhetorical or otherwise. <laughs> no, that's very true. <laughs> Cool. This is like a therapy or something. What words do you use? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Um, but generally, 95% of the time, I actually am interested in what somebody said. Um, I feel like it's one of those words where you don't have to say yes or no to what they've said. You can go, that is interesting, because yeah. it is interesting. But you don't necessarily have to agree with them or disagree with them. So, so yeah, <laughs> it's cool. Um, Andy I'm says, really Miss Murphy, we've got what I say now as well. <laughs> Um, Andy says, missed working with you a uh, lot uh, of last year for the show. Yeah, it is it is weird, yeah. like, not seeing reps and people and, and customers just come through the doors just normally. Um, I've seen a few at the door do click and collect, which has been really nice. Um, but, yeah, the show is missing that kind of vibe of all the crazy beforehand that nobody sees as we're, like, <laughs> hoovering everywhere and sweeping everything up and moving boxes, et cetera. Um, and then on a day, just... It's just a full-on time, but really good time to see everybody enjoying photography. So, yeah, hopefully we can get back to that in the not-too-distant future. Hopefully we don't have to, like, have somebody stood at the door checking passports or something for you to come in. Um, 
but that we'll see. You might do that in the pub at this rate. So there we go. Um, <laughs> show us your passport for a pint. Um, there's there's definitely going to be some work on the marketing of that, isn't there? Passport oh, or no pint. <laughs> uh, Steve says, afternoon, guys. Afternoon, Steve. Good to see you. Paul. Yes. <laughs> what word are you going to use to bring David on? <sighs> Uh, I, I, you could I, say I, the brilliant David. I could do. I, I think it's it's going to have to be. Everyone, please welcome the brilliant Mr. David Yeoman. Oi. <laughs> Good afternoon. Are you ready Thank for you this, David? For joining us. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It depends uh, which direction it ends up going in. But uh, we, we've got a few things. Well, to could be anyone this in on this show. I tell you. Yeah, <laughs> he's going to have a piece. Of- paper that says hashtag help <laughs> yeah yeah uh, probably, probably need one of those big big thank you for coming on um no you know it's, it's it's been it's been great sort of you know because it we sort of seem to have you every week as well which has been absolutely awesome just sort of you know following us along and stuff and i don't know how joel feels but it's really nice knowing that david's just sitting there just sort of watching in the background <laughs> yeah ready to tell us when we're wrong don't you feel like a slight comfort from it as well yeah knowing that oh, at least yeah. at least you know someone's going to be there it's, it's you know, like the uh, it's like the human photographic version of google i think or wikipedia <laughs> yeah something like that Some no sad, it's just like you're, you you technique. blend no, you blend knowledge and passion and ability in photography. I think that's what <laughs> that, that's oh. like what Paul and I enjoy because you're not you're not a ultra like pixel peeping person. Like you actually enjoy no, photography, no, I, for photography. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and and you're good at it. <laughs> like you're not one of these people who's got a super expensive camera and they take pictures and they're rubbish. <laughs> they're always good pictures. So I feel like that's that's I think that's the comforting part for me. Because it's oh, not like, oh, you're wrong, and then you're, uh, you're rubbish at photography, so I don't care if, I, if you think I'm wrong. <laughs> so, and also for me, I like speaking to you because you can like answer my technical questions, of which I have many. But I've decided to leave my stack of paper at home because there was a lot of questions written down. Yeah, I'm, sh- I'm sure there were. <laughs> I'm sure there were. But we we had one hanging over from last week, didn't we? That Paul was going to mention, and then decided he wouldn't until this week which was curved sensors wasn't it um, yeah oh curved sensors yeah yeah got to get yeah, to so that one are we gonna so, go are we gonna go straight in at curved sensors oh i think we could go straight in with curved Ooh. sensors couldn't we yeah let's uh, oh, brilliant this is on. fantastic <laughs> <laughs> right, well, oh and just before we start anybody got any questions or don't understand what we're talking about and want us to re-explain just pop it in the comments and we'll happily help out this is Going to yeah. be hopefully a blend of laughing about technology, but also informative and useful. But yeah. some of the things might not make sense, and that's okay. Just ask us to explain, and we'll happily yeah. explain it. Um, so. Yeah, and a good. It's going to be a good little opportunity for like if anyone's unsure about anything, you know, th- th- this would probably be a good episode. Just like you know, I've, I was reading through my manual, and it, I came across this sentence, and I, you know, I wasn't too sure exactly what it meant, or something like that, so between between the three of us here, I, th- I think, you know, if, you know, we've got a good chance of answering your questions this week, so yeah, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the comments, and we can get to them. <clears throat> I've got um, one last question before we carry on. Who's going to yeah. hashtag tell us we're wrong if David's wrong, or are no, we I assuming think... that David is never wrong? I think can we nominate somebody in in the comments? Yeah. Who's, who's still watching? Somebody put their hand up in the comments, and you can tell us if we're wrong. Do you think Johnny Mo can take up the mantle? Yeah, maybe. Or... It's like one of these game shows, isn't it? Where we tell three different truths or not truths. Yeah, one exactly. Of, one of us is lying, or one of us yeah. is saying the truth. Would I lie to you? Yeah. Other game yeah. shows are available. Yeah. Cool. Let's start with curve sensors. Yeah, why why okay. did it? Why did you want to ask it, Paul? I can't remember now. Um, You'd I, I read think, about it. Yeah. No. I think I think it came up because there was um, obviously there's been some investment into the uh, curve sensor sort of section of the photographic industry. Uh, we've seen a couple of uh, couple of lens manufacturers start to introduce 
um, to, to make lenses for the curved sensor. Um, obviously, I can't remember exactly when it was. Was it the end of last year that sort of patent, uh, patents got sort of announced that uh, curved sensors were coming? Uh, well, there's there's for... two areas here. I mean, Sony have done a lot of work on curved sensors over the last few years um, and have shown prototype curved sensors at odd, odd times. Um, and there's also a new French company, a French startup company that has, has, is trying to produce the first uh, full frame curved sensor. Wow. Um, because historically, it's always been easy to make small sensors. And the bigger the sensor is and the more pixels it's got, the more chance you have of having a defective sensor. Yeah, um, sure. and that makes and sense. Has, this goes back to you know a long long time ago because back in the late 90s there used to be a, a camera called the uh kodak mega plus which was an industrial based camera it was a high yeah. resolution camera at about one megapixel um at the time but you could buy <laughs> it with three different grade sensors so a grade one sensor was perfect a grade two sensor had a number of faults on it and a grade three sensor had even more faults on it, and the prices <laughs> varied. And you'd get a little, you get a document describing where the faults were on the sensor, so that you knew which pixels to avoid. That's um, mad. It, it is mad, but I mean, it's like buying a used car. Those, those two tires are bold. It's got a misfire <laughs> on cylinder three, <laughs> and it goes around corners the wrong way. Yeah. So, so at, at the moment, I mean, the, the concept of a curved sensor is that it, it reflects the retina of the eye more. Yeah. So you will see a, a more realistic view. Um, and the, the 120 years of optical development that we've had in trying to get lenses to produce perfect images towards the sides and the edges would be simplified with a curved sensor lens because it would need less elements to, to project onto the onto the side of it um the the drawbacks are um it's much much harder to fabricate something that is curved than it is yeah. to fabricate something that is flat um also we've got a market at the moment that is almost entirely based on lenses that are designed to project onto a flat surface so um but for some new markets um especially the emerging sort of the phone is going to do everything market um, yeah. curved sensors have potentially got some benefit because a yeah. there'll be a smaller sensor so they'll be easier to physically manufacture <clears throat> than the big sensors um, and b because of the reduction of the optical size of the amount of uh, lenses you need within the optics you'll be able to get much more flexible lenses including potentially small zoom lenses all into a into a mobile phone. Um, yeah. I think the chances of it happening on um, on normal sort of consumer photography, professional photography, if it does happen, it will be a long, long way away. Um, yeah, because we'd be top. we'd be talking about a whole new lens mount system as well, exactly. wouldn't we? And exactly. We, you know, we've seen um, you know we've seen Canon obviously come out with the with the R mount. So and obviously. As, as far as like a legacy uh, product as well, you know, with like the uh, the the EF mount that they've got, um, you know, so we're, we're probably not going to see anything from Canon uh, sort of anytime soon. They may introduce it possibly, possibly into the cine sort of industry, uh, but for for a manufacturer to produce a whole new lens mount is is going to be once again quite a big deal and we've seen a lot of the manufacturers sort of say look this is the lens mount that we're going to be using uh and you know with bringing a new lens mount comes out a, a load of other things as well you know it's the marketing it's getting your your old users onto the new system and uh, would you need it would you need a new lens out. mount though possibly, because especially possibly with z mount z mounts massive in terms of diameter so surely yeah. There's enough space for all of that to go in there. Possibly. I mean, the throat of your lens mount will, will determine whether you'd need a new lens mount or not. And also, given that it's curved, the amount of glass that would be required, etc. You would only use like a new lens with the the uh, new sensor, wouldn't you? You wouldn't have to, you yeah. wouldn't be able to like, you know, uh, backwards yeah, compatibility. It, well, it, so 
you'll get optical distortion if you use the non-curved yeah. lens with a, so, with a sensor and vice versa. So it's entirely possible that um, Canon or Nikon with their bigger new um, mounts would potentially say, we could actually produce a fairly decent range that would um, pair well with our new curved sensor without yeah. having to create a whole new mount system. I, I still think it'll end up <clears throat> in the mobile phone if it ends up anywhere yeah. um, and possibly yeah. combined with a liquid lens as well. Um, yeah, and a liquid lens for, for people who've not heard of a liquid lens is basically if you alter the, the voltage and the current passing through the lens, you can alter the optical characteristics. So you can have a, a lens that will change its focal position or um, alter its focal length even based on electrical signals that you're passing into it. Yeah, it's pretty mega. Could, um, we, could the sensor see... be dynamic or oh, something? That's such a Go lot on, of lag. No, you're all right. I was going to say, would it be possible, or is this just too far down the road, to um, have a dynamically curved sensor? I, I What, so it went curved or flat? Yeah. I, yes. I, or would that be too no, difficult? No, 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 I think that would be too challenging. Sure. Because I was just thinking, you know, with a new LC, oh, not an LCD, but new screen technology panels that are flexible and they're bringing out flexible yeah. phones. Obviously, they just bend at the moment. But I was just wondering if, that same mentality could be used. I, mean, I suppose it, it's it's <clears throat> possible, but you know, I, I think I think for the consumer elect, consumer photography and professional photography, which on the whole is a is a shrinking global market in comparison with the the rise of the phone. Uh, I agree, yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but um, I, I just don't think there's the the you know there'll be the investment to to deal with sure. it. <clears throat> um, but you, you raise an interesting point with the RF lens. Um, and other new lens mounts um, plus glass as well because one of the things that we've had in the last five to ten years is, is really a megapixel arms race um, yeah. from, from the camera manufacturers. They're starting to slow down now um, and part of the reason that they're slowing down is the quality of the glass that you need to actually resolve to make use of these greater than 50 megapixel sensors. Um, and this was noticeable when Canon launched the 5DS and the 5DSR. They then had to revamp. They had four lenses, didn't they, at the start? That well, they had to revamp the number of their lenses to have <coughs> enough uh, resolution in the lens itself to make use of the sensor. Yeah. Um, now, and no that's... doubt the RF mount lenses are probably good to 120, 150 megapixels or whatever. Really? That high? They're certainly Goodness. good to 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's mad, and, isn't it? And you know, and and equally, the Sony G mount glass and so on will will have a similar kind of kind of resolution. We know that the GFX glasses will go greater than 100 megapixels. It already Ooh. does. Um, <laughs> so you know, it, it the quality of glass is is something that people need to bear in mind with a camera purchase. Definitely, because yeah. it, it's no good buying you know a <coughs> your 70 megapixel camera. And throwing, you know, a cheap, low-cost lens onto the front of it because you're almost wasting your money. Uh, yeah. the um, the A seven R four kind of brought that out quite a lot, didn't it? Because um, people wanted this really accessible sixty-two megapixel camera, full frame um, sensor, and then realised that they were going to have to reinvest in a whole new range of glass because yeah, exactly. it just half of it just couldn't cope. I remember reading a very detailed article, and I didn't read all of it because it was very long, but a guy had got an A7R4 and gone through every single lens available um, in terms of E-mount or FE um, and, and told you how good it performed. And I was like, this is bonkers, like how, how few lenses were good enough to work with the A7R4, which is going to be a very popular camera if anybody wanted, you know, seriously high megapixels uh, on a sensor. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's crazy how how much they can fit onto a sensor now. <laughs> uh, well, you own um you own a, a, a medium format camera with high pixel density and you've played with um have you played with the GFX one hundred? No, not the original. One, but, no, okay. Uh, but like that's bonkers to see the quality absolutely. that you can get. Yeah. Um and like you were saying, the lenses, the quality of the lenses to be able to resolve that 
and the relatively inexpensive nature of those lenses. Like, yeah, they're relatively. not cheap. They're not <laughs> cheap, but given the fact that it can resolve 102 megapixels with such great quality is pretty amazing. So yeah, well, we, yeah. we've seen we've seen glass prices, you know, rocket in the last two to three years. Um, you know, Sony with the GM and and Canon with the RF lenses, they, they've certainly started pushing the envelope compared with previous lens uh, lens prices. Uh, and part of that is reflected in in the fact that they will out resolve the predecessor lenses that came before them. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I suppose also, like you said, because of the shrinking global market, they've got to squeeze more money out for Correct. the reduced and, amount of lenses they're going to spend. And, and so the R and D the, they've put. Up. The, the bodies are, are, you know, the bodies are, are changing so rapidly. Um, you know, every couple of years, two to three years, you know, a new variant of a particular body is out from each each manufacturer. They're all all guilty of it. Yeah. Um, which it's crazy really... to think, you know, twenty or thirty years ago, you might have had a new camera released every five or ten years. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's like you can start counting every couple of years or every year in some cases. It's yeah bonkers. But I suppose that's what keeps us open. <laughs> People yeah. wanting new things to say. Um, shall we just have a look at the, uh, the comments yeah, before we carry on a little we bit? We have a look at some of the comments before we go down another little hole. <laughs> yeah, and then almost um, some of the comments don't become irrelevant. Johnny there says we we're already wrong. <laughs> there we go. Cheers, Johnny. Uh, uh, Andrew says there goes the male audience, as we would need to admit to reading the manual. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Um, JP says curve sensor will require new lenses. You're indeed correct. Um, and um, Andy says, uh, why would you need a curve sensor and would it need new lenses? Um, hopefully we've covered why you need. Well, need is an interesting word. I think the so advantages it, of a curve sensor. Um, it, yeah, so the, the, the main advantage, just, you know, once again, just to highlight is you're able to produce lenses that can uh, can take a lot more light. So it enables you to uh, uh, potentially have faster aperture lenses, basically. And you're in interfering, nutshell. you're interfering with the light less, aren't you? You're, you're not having yeah, to so less, less tweak how it's to correct back to that flat field so uh potentially lenses can be smaller it's all sort of fairly uncharted uh sort of territory at the moment so um but uh th there's definitely advantages that's why there's people do research into it but uh but you can get you know, a potentially to, lighter lenses can't you lighter lenses, lighter yeah. lenses. it'd yeah. be interesting as well um to see um, if you know if it ever did become mainstream outside of phones or maybe even in phones that becomes a metric to measure, you know, the quality of a curved sensor. Obviously, uh, David, you said about pixels in this arms race of sensors. Will they say, oh, this is a one degree curved sensor versus a two degree curved sensor or whatever? And that will be the measure of how good a camera you've got is by the degree of curve or <laughs> whatever it has in it. Like there's got to be some marketing speak to come along with it, hasn't there? Yeah. The whole curvy is better sort of scenario. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like curvy sensors. Uh, right. Um, so Andrew says, I think it'd be far more difficult to get high tolerance curved sense surfaces compared to flat ones. Um, yeah, I think that would be the manufacturing side of curved sensors would be bonkers. And also being able to keep it within, um, you know, uh, quality assurance tolerances as well. I suppose that would be quite a difficult one as well wouldn't it? and i suppose also the way the light interacts because one pixel is going to be closer or some of the pixels will be closer to the light versus and how do you compensate for all of that as well so but, um right uh johnny says presumably it would uh, for a normal lens on a curved sensor would result in a squash ring on the edges of the image reverse of flat sensors having stretched edges what it could mean is that the lenses would become even lighter yeah definitely yeah. i think um yeah, there's quite a lot of interesting thoughts about why curved sensors would be a good idea. Um, there's also a lot of electronics behind a sensor which would be more difficult to connect. Do you think that would be a big enough hurdle to prevent it happening on a wide scale, David? No, I mean, that, <coughs> he, Andrew's right. Um, there is a lot of electronics and 
if we move to the next into the slide after we've gone through these comments, we can talk yeah. about electronics and stack sensors um, sure. and their benefits or not benefits. Um, you know, there is going to be more and more electronics behind the sensor. Um, so, you know, that that's the nature of what we're well, going to do. Go, and going, we, going forward, there will be. Absolutely. Yeah. And as we move towards, you know, potentially holding pic image, you know, a frame in memory behind the sensor or global shutters, et cetera, et cetera, it's just going to be more and more. So it's just going to get more complicated. Um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, Andy says, I've said for years that the majority of photographers don't need all these pixels as glass costs would be will be huge. As most print only A4, A3 plus, they will not see the investment price tag. I think that's going to be an age old argument in the digital um, realm, isn't it? In terms of. I, I think what... it is, but there, there is a benefit <clears throat> with the large megapixels um, in the fact that compression effects aside, you can yeah. get away with needing less glass. Um, yeah. because you know uh, a, a, a 35 millimeter image at 50 megapixels might be 32 megapixels at 50 millimeters sure. it might be 21 megapixels <clears throat> at 65 millimeters and you know and so yeah. on and so you, can, you know you can crop more you can absolutely crop more and and one of the things that people have said regarding the gfx 100 because a lot of people said well why do you have 102 megapixel sensor in your camera you just don't need that sort of resolution even for printing billboards because you don't look at a billboard with your nose on the on the billboard but you know a very valid point is if you do um a top half body shot with a um a gfx 100 you can crop out the face you could use the eye just for an you know an eye makeup yeah. type um advert you know you've got all of that within one single image at the resolutions that the the the, the advertisers will require yeah, um, yeah. So there I, are some benefits <clears throat> to that also from an editing point of view in terms of retouching for um people in that realm where they need to do a lot of retouching having more megapixels could be quite helpful to get a smoother image or you know a, an image that doesn't look like it's been um tweaked in any way because you've got more information to work with um, which do, I think is quite important. Computer. Say again. You do need a gruntier computer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought you said you're going to have a grumpy computer. So. <laughs> well, you will have a grumpy computer yeah. until you get a decent one. Yeah. 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 That's true. Um, Andy says, got to leave you guys. Sorry, jab time approaching, so I have to get it. Uh, no problem. Uh, good to see you, and uh, hope it all goes well. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, the megapixel thing also is becoming perhaps less of an issue with backside illuminated sensors as well um, sure. in terms of um, low light capability, which I'm sure you're going to come on to next. So yeah. do you want me to put your yeah. slide up on the screen? Pop up, pop up the slide. There we go. OK, so um, <clears throat> historically, um, in terms of sensors, we've got what's under the regular side. We, we have a, a, a micro lens on the front of the uh, the sensor so one micro lens for every cell within the sensor um, a color filter um, which we can come on to on a on another slide <coughs> then there was a small pile of electronics um, or, or wiring if you like that got the information out of the the uh, photodiode and then there's a photodiode um, at the bottom um, and effectively <coughs> if you think of um, light coming into the sensor as liquid so you're pouring yeah. liquid in and it fills up the photodiode um, at the bottom. So the, your photodiode is is your your vessel, if you like, that that holds the holds the light. Now the and lower... the color filter changes whatever the color Correct. of the liquid yeah. is. Well, okay. I've shown them green here, but we'll come. I've got a second slide with with the with the color on it. Um, cool. So cool. You're well, so well, well prepared, David. Compared I, to I know, <laughs> I know. The, the lower down the photodiode is <clears throat> away from the micro lens the the more attenuated the signal becomes all right so the signal is just not as strong by the time it gets into the the photodiode um, sure. so one of the things they did with the backside illuminated uh sensor uh the bsi sensor which is now becoming much more common um and is certainly in a lot of sony cameras <laughs> um it's also in the new gfx 100s 
Um, is that because technology has become easier in terms of it, manufacturing it them? Yes. It's a manufacturing hurdle to get over it, to, to create what they need to create within the silicon effectively. Um, sure. The photodiode has been moved up to the, the top. So a BSI sensor is, on the whole, more sensitive than a regular sensor. Sure. But when we talk about sensitivity, we've also got to talk about the size of the vessel that the 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 liquid light, if you like, is being poured into. Sure. Um, so quite often what happens is, is that a manufacturer will increase the number of megapixels and make the sensor BSI at the same time. And the sensor only ends up with the same sort of sensitivity that it had, the regular sensor had previously. Sure. Um, Makes sense. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's what happens. But, you know, there's no getting away from it. If you want to work in low light, you need large photodiodes. Because yeah. um, when, when we're talking about sensitivity, we're, we're sort of talking about how well a camera performs in low light, aren't we? So correct, the, more yes. sensitive, the more sensitive your camera is to light, uh, obviously the better it can perform in lower light conditions. Yeah. And so, also that directly affects your dynamic range as well. Correct, yes. So again, the bigger the fatter the pixel, uh, in all intents and purposes, um, the better quality, in inverted commas, image you're going to get in, into the into the cell. Um, sure, and, yeah. and this is one of the reasons why manufacturers like Sony across the A7 range have three variants of camera. So they, yeah. you have your regular A7 camera, the A7 III at the moment, 24 megapixels. You have a high resolution version, which currently is the A7R4. Um, so that sacrifices sensitivity um, in comparison with the, the regular A7. And then you have the A7S series of cameras, which have a much lower um, pixel density um, and much bigger pixels. Um, and they're much, <coughs> much better in, in low light. And Sony have aimed those at the generally yeah. at the video. That market. camera, yeah, video. that camera, you don't even need a light to take pictures. <laughs> You could be in a dark room and you'd still get an image. Yeah. It's ridiculous how sensitive they are. A single yeah. LED light. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> One. And 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 it's now, madness. where manufacturers are going now is that we're getting onto what's called a stacked sensor. So the amount of electronics at the bottom of the BSI stack is increasing. Yeah. So um, it enables more to be done with a sensor so the, the 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 additional electronics could be more memory it could be a faster method of reading the data out of the sensor um you know the, and ultimately it could be a global shutter um we'll come on to shutters i think a, a little bit later um but so so this is why things like the sony a7 uh, a9 rather with it a92 with its stacked sensor has yeah, yeah. much faster readout um, off the off the rolling off the electronic shutter than um, traditional cameras do off the electronic shutter because it's got more electronics behind it, um, sure. and we're going to see more and more <clears throat> electronics going behind the sensors and making them more and more effectively complicated. Because um, I'm guessing, I think the the hurdle was it's just like right. Well, let's try and find a way of getting the electronics underneath what the, the area that records the light and now actually you know uh whoever designs these things are actually going well we could actually probably put an infinite amount of things behind this now uh Correct. you know what can we what can we put in there to you know help help this camera perform better? this deep <laughs> Yeah, why and is this camera a, so chunky? <laughs> and then a, and then a heat sink this big on the bottom of that as well. Yeah, so so that, it that's so that's warm. where it's where it's going. Um, and if if I switch over to the Joel mentioned the the color filter array. If I switch over to the the color filter um, side of things, um, all consumer cameras have. Uh, a color filter array over the top of effectively a monochrome sensor. Um, yeah. Then using um, 
software algorithms, they work out the color of each individual cell <clears throat> based on its nearest neighbors, its nearest neighbors to that and neighbors beyond, etc. cetera. Um, this means that um, a color camera isn't as spatially accurate as a monochrome camera um, because you're interpolating the, the, um, the value that's going to be in each pixel. If you've got a monochrome camera like the Leica monochrome um, or um, the Q2 monochrome or whatever they've got now, those cameras have a certain sharpness inherent on the images because they don't have to do this calculation um, to determine what gray value, if you like, is within each within each cell. So sure. traditionally, most cameras have got a Bayer sensor, which is the one shown on the on the left hand side. Here, yeah, left as you look yeah. at it. Yeah, um, <laughs> Fujifilm um, have their own version called the X Trans. Uh, center, which is the one I've shown on the right hand side. Got to love an X trans. Um, now, you know, there are <coughs> potential benefits from an X trans sensor, and there are some potential um, disadvantages with an X trans sensor. Um, the, the benefits, one of the benefits, are is the fact that you, on every row on the sensor, you have every color of the filter. Yeah. Sure. So it's so it's less susceptible to moire type patterns um, and potentially could give you a, a truer color um, effect. Um, yeah. But it requires a lot more processing to demosaic a X-trans sensor than it does to a Bayer filter. Sure. Um, but what is that just because they're not as regular in the same way as a Bayer is very consistent and regular? Yes, and Bayer's well known. I mean, you know, Bayer demo demosaicing has been around for a long time now, sure. um, and so people are, you know, <clears throat> it, it's a widespread thing. There are slightly different interpretations of the way that it's done, um, but but one of the more interesting things, and something that is very likely to come along to cameras in the near future, is something called the quad Bayer. Um, now, okay. this is what I've drawn in the middle. So here we have blocks of four cells. Okay. Yeah. Now, as I was explaining to Joel earlier in the week, <laughs> this, this, is, <laughs> this has got a number of advantages. You can use it as a high resolution sensor. You've got a more software work to do to interpret what value should be in each individual cell. Um, but you can also use it as a lower resolution sensor to effectively give you four light wells for every pixel in your image. So yeah. if you've got an 85 megapixel camera, which there are rumors flying about uh, in the near yeah. future, then you could have a 21 megapixel image, which would work better in low light because you're using the combined values of the four cells together. It's pretty game-changing, that, isn't okay. it? In there's, terms a, of... there's also another potential <clears throat> game-changer to it, as I was explaining to Joel. On both those scenarios, you're actually reading all the data off the sensor. Supposing you only read one element out of each cell, you're still getting a 21 megapixel image, OK, but you've you've sacrificed the amount of data that you're getting. So you're now getting a quarter of the data that you were getting compared with an 85 megapixel image, which means you could run at a much, much higher frame rate. So you could still reading off the full sensor. So is it directly um, uh, correlation, a direct correlation whereby it could be four times faster or four times as light sensitive. Correct. Yeah. Either either one of those. Ooh, the four, bonkers, times, isn't it? The four <laughs> times faster, the four times faster wouldn't have um, so much spatial accuracy as sure. the the higher resolutions. Um, but because, where would that be an issue? Where where would you need that spatial accuracy? 
you wouldn't necessarily because the times you're use you'd be using that would be in machine gun mode for you know the person doing the long jump at the olympics or whatever isn't it yeah that that's the that's the scenario but it means that potentially you could run the sensor given the right electronics behind it four times faster so if Goodness. you've got a 15 me frame per second 85 megapixel sensor and you now read it out at 21 megapixels, you could run it four times faster, giving <clears> you 60 frames a second. So oh, you're amazing. getting an even broader hybrid camera in that it could do excellent low light video, like an A7S III, but it could potentially be producing the quality yeah. images of an A7R4. And you could then have A9 two speeds of frames per second, yeah. I mean, all off one make, sensor. Your, your problem here is memory. <clears throat> Um, your, you, you know, and this is where the stacked sensor might come into into more play because as stack sensors get developed, we may find that a stack sensor might hold a buffer of say ten images, and then we can write those out to the card slightly slower okay. because it, it can just hold the information. So, are we potentially getting to a place, if not already there, where the sensor is producing more information than? The processor and all of the kind of electronics the the cabling oh, we're, essentially we're well in that place already i mean you've, so we're bottlenecking uh, electronics because the sensor is just pulling in too much data yeah as i said at the beginning there's a set of compromises with everything and yeah, if, sure. if, if you know one of the compromises you make with a consumer camera over the sort of industrial cameras that i use for work my industrial cameras i can give as much power as i like I can stick loads of heat sinks around them. I can keep them nice yeah, and yeah. cool, and I can get the data off at ridiculously fast rates um, because I'm yeah. just running it on a 10 gigabit Ethernet connection or whatever. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's a different work. You know, if you had all of that in a consumer camera, it, it would be too hot to hold. <laughs> I was just about to say. <laughs> I, I think I think the main I think the main thing is is because we we hear it all the time, don't we? And it's like it. It, it trends very well when a camera is too uh, is too hot. You know, it, it overheats. You know, it, as soon as a camera overheats, and you know they they overheat for a reason. Uh, yeah. But you know, the internet loves it, don't they? You know, people yeah. just jump on it and go. You know, this camera overheats. So you know that compromise there is is almost to do with a little bit of. Um, it you know of of how people are going to react to it it's just like yeah we can do this but the camera is going to get it's going to get warm so you know when you yeah, touch it, it it's going to get no, warm everything that we desire requires more processing um yeah. and we already know now you know you've only got to look at some of the gaming pcs and so on and see the number of you know the amount of cooling you know they're water cooled they're yeah. you know there's a yeah. you know, nine fans inside the machine a, a heat sink you know the size of a small biscuit tin um, yeah. <laughs> on top of the processor you know it, it's it all requires more so, and more processing and, and therefore so what you're so what you're saying is the camera will either have to be as big as a toaster or as hot as a toaster <laughs> or in my <laughs> cases it will just burn his fingers <laughs> <laughs> uh, right so, so uh, this is segueing into shutter because of yeah, the, the, data the la processing the la the last thing that i i want to cover because i think it will just blow anyone's mind if we carry on with too much stuff is, yeah, is shutters. Right. in, in We've essence, already had a couple of minds blown i think yeah. <laughs> in essence um we have most of the cameras have got a mechanical shutter and and basically the mechanical shutter you know works a bit like the shutter did in the old film cameras it, it opens lets the light in closes again OK, and that's that click clink noise that you hear when you, you press the shutter button. Now, you've also got um, an electronic shutter in most modern cameras. Um, and certainly all mirrorless cameras have got an electronic shutter in it. Um, to use the electronic shutter, you actually um, just open the mechanical shutter and let the, 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 um, the cells gather light for a period of time they then reset themselves gather light for a period of time reset themselves which is how you get your evf display or your live view um yeah. display um but the problem we've got and it's down to processing power heat and everything else 
is that we cannot read all the data off the shutter in one go at the moment, um, which is why we have um, what we call a rolling shutter. So your sensor, we read the data off the sensor effectively row by row or blocks of rows <coughs> at, at a time, um, which is why when you use an electronic shutter on fast moving objects, you can get the objects tearing in the image. Because like the a fan looking like a jellyfish. A fan, exactly. Or, you or know, an octopus. A, you know, a bus looking like a parallelogram. It, it's yeah. it, all, all sorts of things. Now, in my world with the industrial cameras, virtually every camera we've got has got a global shutter on it because, again, yeah. we're not worried about heat. You know, I, I can go out and buy an industrial camera with a full frame sensor, which will take Nikon F mount lenses. Um, and it's got, a, you know, a 24 megapixel sensor in it and it's got a global shutter on it and it will read out at eight frames a second or whatever um, without any any problems at all. But that generates a lot of heat. Um, sure. So what we what we're the industry is aiming at is to try and eliminate the mechanical shutter and turn to a global shutter, removing the electronic you know, sorry, removing the rolling shutter in the process. And we're starting to see this with the stack sensors. Um, the more we information we get at the in the stack sensor, the more chances are we are going to have of getting a global shutter handheld um, camera. Um, and the, the first manufacturer that produces <coughs> one of those that is reliable um, is going to do really well in terms of the sports type um, market, uh, the professional market. Um, yeah, that's because be really the interesting, other, isn't it? The other advantage with rolling shutters and global shutters, <coughs> being electronic shutters, is that they're silent. Hmm. So you know, if you wanted to, use, if you want to use a camera in um, in a at a wedding or at a you know a snooker event or something like that, then the noise of the shutter has an effect, and often sure. you're asked you know to run it quietly. Yeah. Um, sure. But then you've got the disadvantages of the of the rolling shutter. So global shutter at 120 frames per second is like the the gold standard for video cameras in the future that yes. don't overheat. I mean, you know, I, I've got industrial cameras that will run, you know, several hundred frames <clears throat> a second. Um, they might only be five megapixel, sure. um, but, you know, they'll still do 200, 400 frames a second. So um, in the future, what you do with all that data, mind you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So. That's going to be the key, isn't it, with video cameras as we go to 8K, 16K, and however many more numbers in front of K they're going to put. And yeah. then having the issue of rolling shutter if they can't increase the readout at Correct. 120, 240, or whatever it is. So we're held back literally by heat. We just need to go to the Arctic yep. and photograph, and job will be a good one. Yeah. Or have a Some small canister. Yeah. Small and canister of liquid nitrogen. To, uh, global warming there as well, isn't it? <laughs> That's got more yeah, people won't need combi boilers cameras. anymore. They won't need combi <laughs> boilers. They just need security cameras with global shutters at 8K. <laughs> no, heat the house up just enough. Yeah. <laughs> but having said all of that, there is nothing wrong with a, a five-year-old <clears throat> camera. It's perfectly capable in the right yeah. conditions of taking yeah. some absolutely stunning um, yeah, images. Definitely. One quick question. Um, you know, with a rolling shutter, will there be a case where they get to a point where they just can... Ha you've got one line of pixels there, essentially. Could that cluster be more and more pixels? So yeah, it, we it, might it, get it, to it quarter can, readout. It can, bank, it can be a bank of a row. You know, it, it, in <clears> some cameras already, it, it might be, you know, 16 rows. It might be, it might be 256 rows of rows of data and and one thing you can do with a with a rolling shutter is that you can start acquiring data for the next image while you're reading out cells further down the further down oh, the line yeah. um on a, on a global shutter you've got to read it all out in one go bang sure yeah. um, which again gives you processor headache yeah because it's a lot of information in that whatever yeah, time but, scale but, it was you know the yeah. fact that you fact that people are considering putting memory in the stack now yeah, means yeah. That effectively once you've read it into one bit of memory you can read <clears> it 
you know, you can clock it into the next bit and clock it into the next one and then read so, it out at your leisure. Would you potentially have multiple layers of cache, memory cache, as it passes it down? Okay. Yeah. And also... You're going to get to okay. a point where you are full the buffer, won't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joel, Joel is off. <laughs> yeah, Joel's off now. He is, he is. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right, let's go to the questions, Ooh. Paul. <laughs> yeah. I have one last question before we go to questions. <laughs> yeah, of course he does. Of course he does. <laughs> you know how you've got the one row going down? Could you start reading halfway down as well as at the top instead of having it in bands? Potentially, yes. On a CMOS sensor, the big, <clears> the big difference between – on a CCD sensor, which we had in the very early days, yeah. um, you had to read data out line by line. Sure. Right? On, uh, and – you could read data out on alternate what they called odd and even fields, so every other row. Um, <clears throat> with a CMOS sensor, you can choose where you want to read the data out from. So when you've got a, a camera running in a full frame camera running in APS C mode, the manufacturer could only be reading out the, the area of the pixels of the APS C mode section. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you <clears> think, choose, choose where to read out. Yeah, and I think that comes into a lot of uh, when we looked into Canon as well, where they switch off some of, uh, you know, some of the area that is available yeah. on some of their video modes uh, because they're literally only deciding to do it on a certain chunk, uh, which is yeah, obviously absolutely. keeping keeping the heat down and stuff like that. Hmm. It's very clever, very clever. Right, to the questions before I ask any more. Right. Um, Andrew says um, uh, Sig Sigma had virtual teleconverters using the extra pixel pixels of the FPL. Okay, that's cool. Um, yeah. Um, so what we were other camera about, did that? Uh, oh, the X70 did that, didn't it? Yeah, I, th I think there's quite a few cameras that that have it, and uh, <clears throat> maybe you can assign it to like hotkeys as well. So. Uh, you know, you can push it and then it and then it does it. But uh, yeah, the the signal was good for doing that. So, um, Johnny says, "Where did you find this guy? <laughs> like a camera technical genius." Now, right, we probably should have started with this as a kind of indicator as to where we were going to be. But could you give us a potted bio, David, of why you know so much about sense yeah, technology? Okay. You've touched upon it a few times. But... Very, very, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> I, my day job is working industrial imaging. Um, so I fit, uh, I design systems um, and then fit them to production <clears throat> lines. Um, and I have been doing for 25, 25 years, write software to it having received the image into the computer, write software behind it to interpret the image, um, sometimes at very high speed. Um, I've done work um, looking at things like uh, confectionery bars at 60 bars a minute, uh, 60 bars a second, rather. Wow. Um, other times I'm doing stuff very accurately, robot guidance type stuff, getting a robot to pick things up. So using the camera as the eyes of the, eyes of the machine, um, basically. So um, David's uh, job is the ultimate problem solver visually. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate visual um, uh, problem yeah, visual solver. problem solver. Yeah, a lot of scary software, and a lot of three D maths. Yeah, that's why he's so clever, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he tells us we're wrong. Um, Sarah says, Johnny, I went on one of David Yeoman's um, Liverpool workshop. It was ace. And just before we came live, um, I did ask. Um, David, if he was up for this, um, and we're hopefully in the autumn, if everything goes well, as we all hope and pray it will, um, hopefully we can run another evening workshop, nighttime workshop in Liverpool. Because I don't know if you'll show it in your pictures in a moment. I think I can see one, but you can you see that um, David has a very good understanding of exposure, <laughs> and he can control the highlights really well in his images, um, so you don't see horrible, nasty highlight um overexposure so yeah definitely worth coming on one of those um ian says hi sarah david is very interesting but i think my brain is overheating yeah <laughs> see the, the thing is ian you need to go into your brain and you need to you know put your put those stacks yeah. in you need, that's, that's you need a heat sink with a water-cooled system <laughs> um 
Andrew says, fast, low power chips are possible, but there are a lot of devices after them. And Apple has the most cash. It's very true. Yeah. I think yeah. there's definitely a bit of a silicon arms race going on. Well, it has been for decades in reality, yeah. but I, I, it's Apple, getting Apple worse at the moment. Apple have definitely got the most cash to put behind things, but but Sony are probably at the forefront of, of sensor technology. Um, well, they're the biggest, the aren't they? they? They are yeah. the biggest. They're the suppliers <laughs> of most of the consumer electronics um, sensors and most of the industrial sensors that i use i mean i use cameras by a variety of manufacturers and a lot of the time there was a sony sensor um inside them um there are um, one of yeah. the other manufacturers but they tend to be much more specialist sensors because you could look around our uh, camera cabinets and you could go sony 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 yeah. sony <laughs> sensors. I mean, nikon sensors are sony sensors <clears throat> Fuji sensors are sony sensors yeah it's, so Sorry, it's, it's in yeah you'll get told off um uh, johnny says proper genius with five five um mind blown emojis <laughs> <laughs> there we go we need to we need to get you a t-shirt david hashtag proper genius yeah, and then on the yeah. back a mind blown emoji <laughs> right actually at the, very, I, at the very beginning nope. of that as well we put a very you know what has now turned into a, a, a you know a sort of a hard thing for Johnny to to do at that point because we said you know can you come in at any time we're wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and now we realize you know, yeah, genius. no problem and he's just, like looking at it oh, yeah. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um so I think you're going to show us David in a few yeah, images and um, what few... sensors can actually do in real life yeah I've, I've got a few images here i mean one of the things that i wanted to say was that it's very important with a digital sensor not to pour so much liquid light into the photo site that you overflow it um sure. because once you've That's once you've gone analogy. beyond the highlights there is absolutely nothing that you can do really to recover well you can't do anything to recover them um there may be valid reasons why you can't deal with um with all the highlights in an image um, and that you when the you choose, sun's involved and, and you choose to, to to live with it but if you can properly expose an image or you can use um, bracketing to increase the dynamic range and merge the images sympathetically <coughs> rather than uh, with some nasty hdr techniques then, then what you, you mean you don't love hdr david that, then you'll find that the camera is actually really capable of, of producing some you know some good low light stuff and some good high iso stuff um on, on the subject of high iso i mean the reason why people fail a lot taking images in with in on high iso settings is that their scene is still too dark you cannot yeah. retrieve the black cat out of the black coal hole um you know <laughs> with, uh, unless there there is some form of light but if you if you eat if you take an image where the histogram covers the full spread, then high ISO works really well. I mean, as an example, this is an ISO 6400 image taken handheld on an X100F. So it's an APS-C sensor and it's ISO 6400. But you will see the histogram up the right hand side has, has got good coverage up towards the, the white end. It's actually still blown the lights up at the top. Yeah. Um, but the the the, the you, quality of the image is still yeah. very and you've very got, good. You've got nice uh, gradation in your your darker areas as well, haven't you? Like Correct. in the poster yeah. and the two lines uh, towards the edge of the uh, walkway, yeah. you yeah. can see so, that, that so it's handled it well. Don't be afraid of high ISO, but if you use high ISO, <clears> make sure that your histogram looks pretty decent when you when you take the image. If it's all yeah. down to the left hand side. It will still look rubbish on your computer when you drag the the highlights. And I think there's there's another whole conversation that we can get into, which I don't think we've got time, uh, obviously today. But there is there is definitely a different way of how you expose if you know that you're going to edit a photograph, or if you know that you just want it right in the camera. Um, yeah. Obviously, there is you know we we hear the uh, we hear the phrase that. Oh, I, you know, I want to get it right in the camera, you know, like how I see it and, and things like that. But, you know, potentially there is a better way of of exposing an image uh, to to bring out extra detail that may might look different when you take the picture, 
But then when you bring it into the computer and play about with it, you, you know, you potentially got more sort of more information to play with. But uh, that is, you know, it's like I said, it's a it's a big sort of conversation that really. Yeah, but I mean, it goes I, along. Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, the, this example of basically what Paul is saying. So this image on the left hand side here was taken to expose the highlights correctly through through the bridge. So if you looked at that on the back of your camera, it would look exactly like the image on the left hand side. Um, now, most digital cameras have got reasonably good shadow recovery. Um, now, I'm cheating a bit here because I'm using the GFX um, 50S. <laughs> but in terms of shadow recovery, this is the same image with just the shadow sliders um, maneuvered and the um, the highlights brought down a little and the exposure pushed up. Yeah. Um, if, if I just go on to the, the side here. So this is the original image that was taken. You can see the histogram comes up towards the, the, the right hand side. And this is the, the, the processed image. Um, and you can see the, the adjustments. I can't blow it up here, but the adjustments, uh, are the, the shadows have been pulled up. The highlights have been yeah. pulled down very slightly and the exposure pushed up. But it shows you the level of detail that is that is kicking about um, within within the image. Yeah, and that um, goes along with your um, sense technology explanation earlier. When you've got um, uh, the backside illuminated sensor, or sorry, not this this one's not backside illuminated. No. But the ability, but the ability to gather enough light um, to to have that data available to you after the image has been taken. Yeah. And that's what dynamic range essentially means, isn't it? Is the, Correct, the ability yeah. to stretch yeah. your light the, that you've the captured. Lower, the lower your, the closer you are to the native <clears throat> ISO on the on the on the camera, the the more dynamic range you will get. Um, so if your camera's base ISO is ISO 100, then you'll get the most dynamic range. Just go out and experiment. You know, go out and take yeah. some pictures. With put the histogram on, take some pictures so that it's just kissing the right hand side of the histogram, <clears throat> bring it back into Lightroom um, or whatever, pull the shadow slider up, see what you get. Go out, take another picture where you're only covering perhaps half the the um, the histogram, coming up halfway, and you'll see there's a lot less shadow detail that you can you can recover. So you're suggesting that if you had a choice between 800 and 400 you'd go for 400 because you're more likely to get the shadow detail um, when you go yeah. into post because yeah. you've not because you've not already amplified the information yeah, you're not that's amplifying been captured. the signal yes you get sure. more dynamic range the closer you are to base iso sure cool so oh show the uh, shell garage <laughs> the shell garage <clears throat> So it's another X100F image taken handheld yeah. at night. Um, actually, this one's actually only ISO 1600. Um, but the colours look natural yeah. and accurate, don't they? Um, considering how little light is actually in that image in terms of how much of it in the frame is there. The, head, the headlights in the road are blown out down down on this side here. Yeah. But you can't do much about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as I said earlier, you don't need a modern camera to get a decent image. You know, if your no. camera is 10 years old, you can still get a great image. And I showed one to Joel earlier in the week, which he described as a little Nelly. Um, yeah. <laughs> this was taken on a Fuji X100 10 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with that image. It's, it's as sharp as you possibly want it. Although new cameras are great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're we're great proponents of not having to spend more money if you don't need to. And in yeah. this really easily shows you that in a, in a situation where the light was probably quite difficult, that a, a 10 year old camera is more than capable of capturing an image that renders the color really well. And, and it, it's an attractive image. It's a it, it, it's not an image that you go, oh, it's a bit ropey, isn't it? Like yeah. that would be an image you'd be happy with all day long, um, and it'd print okay. really nicely as well. Okay. And it comes it's around to uh, the the thought <clears throat> process that we always have here, Joel, as well, isn't it? Is that you know, like you know, just to 
just to sort of emphasize on what you've just said as well you know we're not just here to sell you the the most expensive thing in you know if you if you won the lottery and came in and go you know oh i want to buy you know this this and this i've got 100 grand here no we'd probably just let you spend 100 grand um, <laughs> probably not the best analogy but if you were um obviously if if you were getting into photography and say you know i've, I've you know I've got X amount of money that I need to spend. And it's just like, well, you probably don't need to spend that. You know, after we've had that conversation with you, it's something that we would go over and just say, you know, this is what we'd recommend. You know, there's the second hand available because we do second hand here as well. So, uh, you know, for what you need, you may not need to spend as, uh, as, as much money. So, um, you know, we always try and be, be as honest as we can really more than anything, don't we? Well, yeah. I, I, and I think, Oh, yeah, go, go ahead, David. No, 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 you the answer is, is is to get familiar with your equipment. Too many, too many yeah. people, too many people change equipment too often, sure. um, and they're always fighting the technology um, because they've yeah. never got really comfortable and really familiar with with what they've purchased. You, you're much sure. better sticking with a decent body and changing, you know, adding more lenses as your photography journey changes what you want to shoot changes, et cetera, et cetera, then you are chopping and changing bodies all the time. Unless you want something that has a specific requirement. Yeah. yeah. Um, like it, 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 it ticks a box that is, you know, that yeah. definitely needs ticking for you. Yeah. Yeah. And also the other side of, um, well, agreeing with what you were saying is you could go and spend a lot of money. You could buy a GFX 100, for instance. It's quite a, an expensive camera. But it's actually harder to take a good image with that versus a, a less yeah. expensive camera. And also, like David was saying about editing your image, if you've got 102 megapixels to be editing, your your computer has to be grunty or it'll get grumpy. And then if you've got a camera that's only got 16, I say only 16, but 16 megapixels, it's still going to produce a fantastic image. Um, that X100 image was 16 megapixels, wasn't it? The one of the... Uh, uh, 12. 12 oh yeah 12 yeah. my yeah. bad my bad uh, it was the s and the t s yeah. and the t had 16 yeah and the f and v have 24 that's yeah. right no, um i think no 24. that's 26. it 26.3 oh was yeah that, oh, was that two, two two four? <laughs> yeah was that slide, Hashtag, you're wrong <laughs> come on where's it gone uh, oh you were wrong yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. Yeah, there we go. but um but it goes to show that you don't have to have all the megapixels in the world. And also, low megapixels can often make it an easier job, both capturing your image. Um, because the the A7S 3 has 16 megapixels. The A7S 2 had 12. Yeah. Might be wrong. Um, so, again, those can take great images in low light because they aren't having to capture as much light in each of the very tiny pixels because the pixels are bigger. So I think that the moral of the story is you don't have to spend a lot of money because it actually makes your life harder in some cases rather than easier. Yeah. So. With, with great quality comes great responsibility. Ooh, <laughs> all right, Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> right, just quickly go to the comments again. Um, William says, yeah, but Mark three. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And then Johnny says, Lol, he just corrects you live. My job is done. You're right, John. <laughs> we, we've learned to be very humble since David started watching us. <laughs> but, but I've got a special slide for Paul anyway that we, yeah. we, we need to put up. <sighs> <laughs> if you don't know what he's talking about, watch previous videos. Was it last yeah. week or the week before? It, it was It was last it was week. trial of last week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh dear, that was really interesting, wasn't it, Paul? Last week uh, and your uh, yeah. trial, trail come. It yeah. was brilliant. <laughs> trial gate. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Pop them in the comments as we uh, as we uh, come to an end. And um, David, do you think there's anything um, with regard to sensors that might be useful to people that we haven't already covered or? something that we might want to look out for in the future that would be I, useful. I, I think I think that I've probably covered most things and I don't really want to go down a tech le tech. Yeah. <laughs> I know I know you do, Joel, and you could think nothing better of wiling an hour away. Yeah. 
talking about <laughs> the intricacies of photons, electrons, and neutrons. Yeah, but, uh, it's very true. <laughs> I think we'll give that a miss and do that offline. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, no, thank you so much, David, for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, hopefully it has been for you and we've not gotten too geeky. <laughs> no, <laughs> and hopefully not. everybody that's been watching has found it interesting and not too mind-blowing. It, I think the thing with sensors is that whilst it is very technical because it's very um, elaborate electronics, um, you can just disregard everything we've said <laughs> and just understand that somebody else has done a very good job of capturing light for you and you can just use your camera and enjoy it i think the benefit of and why we wanted to do this is that if you understand how a sensor works you can make the most of it um like even learning about using your base iso rather than pushing up to iso 800 1600 3200 etc uh, and knowing that you've got better control in post i think is very useful to understand and also understanding why you might get rolling shutter um and why why global shutter might be interesting in the future but ultimately global shutter for the landscape photographer is not going to make any difference in reality it's not going to make much difference in quite a few genres of photography but if you're into sports and wildlife it might become quite useful if it ever becomes mainstream um but equally i think david has explained the the difficulty of the uh, global shutter becoming mainstream that it's going to have to come up with a way of not creating so much heat that you could uh, fry an egg on top of your camera. So, yeah, you've got a couple more comments in now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, <clears throat> there we go. Steve says, "I only shoot JPEG with my One DX Mark III. Would you reckon I should start using RAW?" Oh, that's an interesting. Well, question. it depends what? what you want. If you're very <clears throat> happy with the JPEGs, stick with them. If you want to get potentially a at all the data that is on your that the camera is captured um, and manipulate it in a way that you want to manipulate it as opposed to a way that Canon have decided they're going to manipulate your JPEG um, then have a play with RAW it's not for everybody yeah. but you know sure, no. it's, it's it's there and I, I think as well is <clears throat> I think you know absolutely spot on there is you know if you're happy with your JPEGs you might as well stick with your JPEGs because um, once again, moving over to RAW does require you to enter that en enter that editing process for every single image that you're going to take as well. So and that's I know just something Steve, to bear in mind. Yeah, and Steve's very into wildlife, as you can see from his picture. So I imagine yeah. he uses the the benefit of a One DX Mark III in terms of its frame rate. So if yeah. you're having to edit potentially that many roars your computer and you are going to really struggle with trying to keep up with that especially if the light is changing a lot or you're moving through a, a, a scene from light to dark or vice versa and you're going to have to tweak the the uh, the settings more than if it was just you know stood still yeah. so to speak so i think, I think so like thing... david says david said with practicing or trialing like just give it a go yeah. and see if you can make the jp uh, the roars look the way you want them to if you can crack on if you can't then maybe leave it you could you could do a, a <coughs> raw plus jpeg day and then maybe just import your raws see if you can deal with what you're you know what you can yeah. deal with or if you get like sort of half an hour in and go oh, i can't be bothered with this then you know you can go back to your jpegs and just uh carry on as normal so yeah definitely. Uh, that's brilliant and, I, hope um, that, I hope that helps steve well he says thanks i'm happy with jpeg well there, there we go happy days um Steve says, brilliant, David. Every day is a school day. It's very true. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Richard says, great video. Very interesting. We're glad, Richard. Um, we hope um, we hoped that today would be. Uh, we knew it was going to be quite technical. But I think David's <laughs> done a really good job, especially with his, his slides, of showing how the technology works in a very simple way and how technology will potentially change in the future. And, how we as photographers will benefit from these clever people who are engineering away in factories all over the world making <laughs> sensors more and more clever yeah it's 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 been nice sort of you know <clears throat> pretending that we're making the decisions on what's happening next and and things like that you know in 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 the industry um 
And I think that's uh, that's definitely a niche that definitely me and Joel needed to scratch at some point. And uh, it's been absolutely amazing having David here just to uh, just to make sure that we're not seeing anything that isn't happening. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, uh, is the film this weekend then? And yeah, the yeah, I'll go back to film this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, yeah, just a, a massive thank you, David, for joining us. It's no, been no really, problem. really interesting. And, um, hopefully, we can have you on again soon uh, to talk about other interesting parts of photography. Um, and also, hopefully, we can uh, join you on a workshop in Liverpool um, and understand uh, nighttime photography. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> no, we'll do that. Um, Sarah wants to do it, so it, it will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> by hook or by crook. Tell me the date. <laughs> so yeah, it's probably probably happened late September, October time, um, yeah. when the nights are getting a little bit uh, darker. Sounds yeah. Good to me. Yeah. And uh, everything's all safe again, which is the main thing as well. Correct. Yeah. yeah so, it needs to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Oh, I didn't say brilliant. <laughs> um, <laughs> well done, me. Um, yeah. We'll uh, we'll just pop you off the screen for a second, David. Yeah, no and, problem. Uh, we'll have a quick chat after the uh, live stream is finished. Okay, uh, thanks, thank you very much for joining us. Cheers, David. Thank you. Well, is is your head intact, Joel? Yes. Yeah. And I really, really I, I, enjoyed it. <laughs> I can see, I can see that there's there's still a, a million questions sort of rummaging around in that uh, in, in that head of yours. There are. I'm pretty sure David comes into the shop and goes. Right, I hope Joel doesn't ask me too many questions. <laughs> I yeah, remember when well, I first well, met him, I was like, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? <laughs> or what day is Joel off? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Dear I just find it I'm really sure interesting. And I love it. I just love it when people know a lot about stuff and I can ask some questions. And the great thing about David is he has the ability to explain it in a way that makes a lot of sense. And yes thinks thinks around the question that you've asked as well rather than just giving yeah. you a this is this and that's that and that's it like understanding where that question probably came from as to why you'd find it interesting to know the answer so yeah it's really interesting so that's brilliant fantastic amazing <laughs> um, your superlatives <laughs> are great <laughs> i know i need to learn more words than the three that i know so uh, yeah. any final thoughts for this weekend before we break up joel no, I think um, have a play with um, ISOs or something like that this weekend and just kind of understand how your camera responds to being asked to do different things. Uh, because I honestly think it will help improve your photography and will help you get the images that you're wanting to achieve um, rather than getting frustrated in editing where you're like, why is the, you know, why is this not becoming the image I want it to when I'm sliding the sliders left and right? I think that's it's very useful yeah. to understand what your camera can and can't do. So you can be yeah. become better at understanding it is very useful. So. And also, no. I hope you all have a great weekend. Yes, indeed. Absolutely, indeed. So um, as always, uh, please <coughs> let us help spread the word of these weekly episodes that we do. Uh, hit that share button. Uh, let all your friends know what we're doing. Uh, like, follow, subscribe our Facebook and YouTube channels uh, so you get notifications so you don't miss out on what we do here. Uh, and I think that's everything for this week. We will yep. see you next week. Until then, bye-bye for now. Cheers. <laughs>